Today in Invest Talk, we look at expected economic growth around the globe in 2025. Then we look at today's market sell off. We answer questions about Humana, Barrett Gold, Novo Nordisk, and more. And at the end, I discuss if the China stimulus is enough to solve their economic woes. This is Invest Talk independent thinking, shared success. Now, our main focus point today is about the global economy and its stabilization uh, amidst many challenges. And this is a latest report from the World Economic Forum. And it's about the global economic outlook stabilizing. And what they found was the majority of chief economists saw, uh, that's 54%, expect the conditions of the global economy to remain unchanged over the next year. So, you know, not great growth, but uh, relative stability. And, you know, that can be viewed as a good thing or a bad thing. Overall, though, the economy is at relatively low growth. And a big part of that is China, right? China has been a driver of global growth for a couple of decades. And the fact that they are now uh, converging much lower in growth compared to where they were, you know, a couple of decades ago, that is a general overall drag on the overall, uh, overall economic growth. And so, uh, now you could say, well, Chinese growth was unsustainable and there's some issues with that, which we can, t- which we'll talk about, but you know, overall, uh, stability seems to be the, the name of the game. And, uh, what the, the, Chief Economist Outlook uh, surveyed leading economists from across industries and international organizations. So this is a pretty broad list of uh, those looking at the broader economy. And they see high debt levels, uh, a a challenge to new growth, uh, new growth agenda. And they also see it clashing with the desire to make growth less damaging to the overall environment, for example, Uh, you know. China's a good example of this. Um, uh, they made solar cells for a long time and they did it very in a very dirty manner by using electricity that was a dry from coal. And so they've kind of uh, weaned off that and they're, they're investing in green energy and mainly nuclear energy. And so that is changing. So that's one small example of, hey, we want economic growth. We want to do it in a more uh, environmentally friendly manner. Now, Public debt overall is a burden in both advanced and developing economies. So that's kind of the new thing is that it used to be the advanced economies were the one, sorry, the developing economies were the ones that typically had the balance sheet issues, but now it's, uh, it's, it's really worldwide. Okay. And these rising debt services costs, uh, are, 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 uh, will crimp the ability for many countries to deal with a potential, any potential problems, right? And about 40% of these economists expect defaults to rise in developing economies over the next year. So basically saying that uh, you're, 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 you're likely to see uh, some of those third world countries uh, go into a default in some way, shape, shape or form. Okay. And the, there, there are many challenges to the continued growth, such as the energy transition, uh, demogra- demographic shifts. We've talked about that in China and uh, Japan and uh, even, even in Europe, where demographics in, in general just make it harder to grow because you know, young people are the, are the lifeblood uh, of, of economies. And if the, the amount of young people are not increasing, then that becomes uh, a challenge because those older people are drag on uh, efficiency in the economy and they take up a lot of uh, you know medical resources and they just don't have the energy to uh, create a lot of economic growth. So demographic issues are an, an issue. And then climate related disasters. We've seen that uh, just recently here in the US. Uh, rapid technological change. Think of AI. How, how much is that going to disrupt current uh, economic trajectories uh, and help it, right? There's, it's just a shift in uh, demand within industries. And then uh, uh, national security needs. We've seen that uh, right now with geopolitical concerns continuing to ramp up. Now, from a regional uh, perspective, almost nine out of 10 expect moderate or better growth this year in the United States. And eight out of 10 uh, agree that the election results will have a significant impact on economic policy, uh, both here and abroad. Okay. Uh, now, in Europe, it looks like things are turning a bit better. 
Okay. Chief economists are modestly optimistic that conditions will improve in Europe. Almost twice as many, 53% expect moderate or better growth next year than they did this year, only 29%. So they're seeing some acceleration in Europe. That's a positive. Southeast Asia is, sorry, South Asia is the standout winner here uh, when it comes to broader economic growth. But once again, continued weakness in China. Latin America and the Caribbean look to surpass global growth averages. So uh, those 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 industries uh, or those set parts of the economy uh, or the world, excuse me, uh, look to, to to see some growth. Now, the inflation on the inflation front, uh, a lot of economists see things getting better really worldwide. So that's a, that's one positive, and that will help the uh, global central banks continue to inflect into a more accommodative stance. And I think that is uh, that's that's certainly a positive uh, for liquidity and the ability for banks to lend and and drive economic growth there. And so, really, why, right now uh, it's it's a steady state, but a lot of uh, risks on the horizon, but also the potential based on easing of policy uh, to uh, get growth to reaccelerate in many parts of the world. So. Um, that's where we're at a lot. It's not hell in the handbasket, but it's also not robust out there either. So pockets of strength and pockets of stagnation as well. Now let's take a quick look at the market today. It was a certainly a, a negative day overall. You had the NASDAQ down, where are we here? Here, there we go. Down 278 points, definitely the weakest here. An interesting uh, day because large cap growth and small cap value were pretty much down equally, about one and a half percent. Large cap value did the best, uh, pretty much tread, tread water. It was only down 13 basis points there. But, uh, you know, this was uh, really all sparked uh, mainly by the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. And that certainly was uh, a, a spark, <laughs> a spark that it was. A bit expected, but overall, uh, just kind of threw a wrench in uh, market expectations. You had uh, energy move higher on this news, and that's probably why that large cap value side was was a bit stronger there. If you look at some of the big winners, United Natural Foods up 30%, and you continue to have some strength out of China as well, uh, despite the geopolitical tensions. Humana was down nearly 12%, Plug Power down 8, Super Micro down about 2.5, NVIDIA down 3.6, Intel down 3 and a third there, uh, Apple down nearly 3%, Pounds here about 2% down, and Rivian down 7%, along with Lucid at negative 7.5% as well. So those were the big movers on the day. And, uh, you know, we we continue to get, ramp up, get, get ramps up in escalation. Uh, from Israel uh, and Iran, Iran launching attacks, uh, ballistic missiles into Israel, uh, and certainly a a contentious situation. And markets are starting to wake up a bit to it. I, I've said this for a little bit that between late August and the election was a period of elevated risk uh, for a market pullback due to liquidity situation the election, and uh, obviously the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. And so uh, we're seeing the, that latter, uh, the, the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East uh, start to really rise, and that is a catalyst. Uh, and when you get a catalyst with lower liquidity, that can create a bit of a market pullback. And we've got the start of that today. We'll see if we have any follow through tomorrow. Hello, guys. I own uh, Turu Perini. Symbol TPC. This stock is its all time high, and I'm thinking about selling all of it. I'm up 130%. What do you guys think? Does this stock have any more room to go up, or is this the time for me to set it all and move on to uh, something else? Thank you. All right, looking at TPC, this is Tutor Perini Corp, and they are out of remember correctly, yeah, uh, here in California. And what they do is they provide general contracting, construction management, and design building service to the private and public customers. And it's mainly about transportation infrastructure, water treatment facilities, and different types of, of, of buildings. So they 
are in the right space. Uh, they they provide site work, concrete forming, steel erection, elect, electrical, mechanical, heating, HVAC systems, etc. So I like the type of business that this is in. And earnings were negative last year and the year before, but they're supposed to make a, nearly a dollar this year and a dollar seventy five next year. Now, based on that, at two twenty six dollars and fifty three cents, if they do make a dollar seventy five next year, you know that's that's not too bad. You know that's a it's a reasonable uh, mid teens multiple on this name. Once again, not too bad. No dividend yield though. And let me see their balance sheet. Yeah, a little bit of debt in the balance sheet, but nothing too crazy. Yeah, I do see kind of a mixed bag here when it comes to the uh, the profitability. Uh, you do have negative free cash flow, but once again, or sorry, negative return equity, but that's because they're losing money. But their their free cash flow has been positive since the second quarter of 2022, and it's at an all-time high. So I, I tend to look at the free cash flow number a lot more than that, that return equity, uh, especially when you're looking forward and you're seeing better profitability. So here's here's what I would say. I would trim it. This is something that a lot of investors don't, they don't consider. They don't consider that, hey, uh, it's not all or nothing. It's not sell it all or, or, or hold on to it all. It, it can be trim it, trim it back. You're, you're doubled your money and then some. Uh, it's probably a much higher weighting in your portfolio than it was when you first bought it. And maybe trimming it back to that original target and having a trailing stop is the likely way to go. Because the momentum is still up. Yes, it's, it's, it's waning a bit. But as long as the market continues to move higher and spending within the, this space is, uh, is robust, uh, this can continue up. So I would use the 50-day moving average as you're out uh, and trim it from here. And, but I wouldn't sell it all because the momentum is still positive. Thanks for the call. Now, we've been telling your friends that our Invest Talk audio podcast is available in video form, and that is over on YouTube, and we get questions submitted via the comment section, and let's get to one of those now. Lynn Dye says, is it okay, tax-wise, to do a transfer from my husband's regular IRA to my Roth IRA? We have multiple accounts at the same brokerage firm, and it's easy to transfer either specific stock or cash from one account to another. The simple answer is no. IRAs are for one person and one person only. Now, you can move money from your regular IRA to your Roth IRA. That is called a Roth conversion. But it has to be your IRA and your Roth. Just like it has to be your husband's IRA into his Roth as well. So there's no combination Roths. You can't move money from one person's IRA of any type to another person's IRA of any type. Okay? It doesn't work like that. One person only. That's it. Okay. So uh, I know it feels nice. You know, we would love to do that. Just consolidate everyone's money into one type of account and have a nice, safe, uh, simple tax efficiency. That'd be great. But no, that's not how this works. You have to make sure that it is uh, one person and one person only. Now, here's another question from our Invest Talk YouTube channel, John. 11174 says, what do you think about Novo Nordis, ticker NVO? And this is, this was, uh, this is Ozempic, right? This is, uh, has been a big, big run over the past couple of years. Let's call it, call it year. Uh, since the, uh, the business has been booming uh, with, uh, with Ozempic, they earned $1.59 in 2021. $1.76 in 2022, but last year earnings were up 57% to 276, up to 339 to this year, and it's supposed to be $4.26 next year. Here's my problem. I've seen this before. Diet drugs are always a fad. They get popular, and then the side effects happen. You can't replace Good diet and exercise. Yes, it, it, it helps people lose, lose weight. And in certain sub uh, categories of people, it, it's probably very helpful. Uh, but, you know, they're giving them out to almost everybody. And there are so many side effects, especially, um, you know, G GI problems that it creates. And then you lose most of the weight, 70% roughly, is muscle. 
and that has longer term impacts. And so, yes, it, it can be very helpful for a certain subset of people, but it's uh, oversubscribed, over prescribed, excuse me now. Um, and I think it will correct itself. And the stock is already starting to correct itself down from 145 to 118. The momentum is fading and I would not chase it here. I think there's a lot more downside to go for Novo Nordisk. Hello, Talk. This is Jose from Brooklyn. I'm calling about a stock. Yesterday, you spoke about a stock called McKesson. Um, you indicated it was a solid company. Um, I was comparing another company, similar sector, since Cora, C-O-R. I was looking to add one of these companies to my portfolio. Sensora seems uh, to have a pretty solid balance sheet. And I was uh, wondering, what's your take on the company? Which one to add to my portfolio? I wait for your answer. Thank you for your time and your investment advice. All right. Looking at Sencora, C-O-R is a symbol. And they're one of the three domestic leading pharmaceutical wholesalers. So it distributes branded, generic, and specialty pharma- pharmacy products. And they are, along with McKesson and Cardinal Health, uh, pretty much the whole pharmaceutical industry when it comes to uh, these wholesalers. And so you're right. There is some overlap in the type of business that they, that they have. Uh, the issue is that McKesson is a, a, a lot broader, right? It's not just focusing on pharmacy distribution, but also uh, medical products. Think of syringes and gauze and, and things like that. And so uh, McKesson is just a, a broader a broader company, uh, a more diversified company, more diversified revenue stream. And now Sencor is good, right? Good business. Return invested capital is 31%. Free cash flows of nearly $4 billion on a $45 billion enterprise value. So that's pretty solid as well. Uh, but the momentum certainly has been waning as of late. It's been down since its high in April. Uh, it was around uh, nearly $250 per share. Now we're down to 224 So it's been just kind of in a 10% trading range since then. Could just be consolidation. But if I look at McKesson... You know, it's in. It, it is down a bit more recently, uh, but generally, it's in a, more of an uptrend. And so, uh, I I would rather own McKesson because of its uh, large diversification, larger diversification uh, within its business. Uh, it's a bit bigger and uh, you know similar type of uh, valuation based on forward looking earnings guidance. So, uh, I, I think Syncor is fine, uh, but I still would prefer McKesson over Syncora. Now, this is Invest Talk. Let's make this two in a row now, and then I will follow up with one of my talking points. Hey, guys. This is Nick from Seattle. I'm calling about stocks that are in the insurance sector. There are two stocks that I'm kind of focusing in on here. One is Brown and Brown, ticker symbol BRO. The other one is Willis Tower Wilson, WTW. I'm comparing these two and I'm kind of favoring Brown and Brown for an investment pick, but both companies are very similar market caps, fairly similar fundamentals and valuations. So looking to get kind of your opinion on if one's better than the other, or if I'm kind of looking in the wrong place with these two companies. Thanks. I look forward to hearing your opinions on the program. All right, looking at Brown and Brown, BRO is a symbol, and Willis Tower Watson, WTW, both in the insurance space. Now, Willis Watson, sorry, Willis Tower Watson, Willis Towers Watson is a global advisory insurance brokerage and solution company, while Brown and Brown is more of a pure insurance agency and broker. Uh, mainly focusing on property and casualty, employer benefits, et cetera. Similar market cap here around 30 billion. And they both do, they both pay a dividend. Yeah, both pay a dividend, but not much, you know, uh, around one, 1% 1 or so. And if I'm looking at one versus the other, Brown and Brown certainly has better momentum. Relative strength is 90 uh, versus Watson is 85, but still, you know, both are good. Uh, earnings expectations, though, for Willis, uh, Willis Towers Watson is uh, trending lower, whereas Brown and Brown is trending higher. So I kind of like that growth there a bit better. Um, so I'm going. I would go with BRO. Frankly, I just like that earnings momentum. I like analysts that are 
upgrading earnings expectations. Their profitability is still very good. 17% on return equity versus 11% for uh, WTW. So I like the areas you're looking at. Uh, I just like uh, Brown and Brown a bit better than Willis Powers Watson. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on China. And you know we had this big bazooka last week uh, that uh, China unleashed uh, to really support their equity markets. And the a lot of people are getting excited about this and say, okay, this uh, could be something that would uh, spin the Chinese economy back into solid economic growth. And I think the simple answer to all this is not really, because there's so many parallels to China and sorry, sorry, China to Japan in the late eighties, early nineties, when they were dealing with their property bust as well. They had a very similar economic trajectory. You know, Japan was uh, buying up real estate here in the U S and they were, uh, they were, they were going to take over the, the, the world when it came to manufacturing. And then obviously uh, China in the 90s uh, really rose to prominence late, late 90s into the early 2000s. And uh, they also had a, a property bubble, debt fueled bubble uh, like, uh, like, uh, like Japan. And so what you're seeing here is the deflationary bust that uh, Japan dealt with uh, many decades ago. And China's GDP growth is decelerating by six percentage points from 10% uh, per year from 1980 to 2010 uh, to about 4% over the next five years. Very similar to what Japan did, seven and a quarter percent from 1946 to 1990, down to just 0.8% growth from 91 to 2023. So very similar type, right? Uh, obviously, China a little bit higher a baseline growth, but that drop in growth, very, very similar. Now, there's something called the three arrows problem. And this was coined by Shinzo Abe uh, in Japan. And it was this prescription for how to get Japan out of their problems. And now Japan is 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 kind of working through, has worked through a lot of those issues, um, still has demographic issues and still has problems, but you know they're getting a, a bit better economic growth. But what he talked about were um, the three arrows, and that was monetary, fiscal, and structural, saying that if you, if you deploy strong fiscal and strong monetary stimulus, that you can cr- create an escape velocity that will, combined with structural reforms, really spin the economy out of the doldrums. And Japan tried this, tried this for many years, and once again, they're... they're they're succeeding a bit, but it took many decades to kind of get here and get out from underneath uh, a lot of the bad debt that was uh, built up during the 80s. Uh, and so despite this uh, you know, big rally in Chinese stocks, if you compare it to what happened in like the Nikkei, right? Nikkei 225, these were, this, this looks very similar, right? Uh, the Nikkei 225 bounced four times by on average 34% from 1989 to September of 1998. And during that time, despite bouncing, once again, four times on average 34% big moves, over that time period, nearly a decade, the Nikkei fell by 66% in total. So yes, stimulus, especially ones targeted in equities, can give you a a quick and sudden um, boost. But until these structural problems are fixed, it's probably not going to really change the trajectory of the Chinese economy. Okay, and Beijing is is is, is a bit worried about spending a ton of money. Right, this that's why this is uh, more about lending to entities that can help support the stock market as opposed to uh, actually spending in the real economy because they just don't really have a lot of places to do that without reigniting a a housing bubble that they don't want to continue to inflate, I think. And main reason is because the Chinese debt to to GDP is at 85% as of earlier this year. And that's three times the level that it was back during the financial crisis in 2009. So there's not as much fiscal room for them to do this. And from a structural perspective, they have a lot of challenges. Number one, we talked about many times, demographics. Over the next 25 years, 
China, the Chinese economy is likely, Chinese uh, dem, uh, demographics uh, population is likely to shrink by about half. And then you have productivity, that uh, growth that's certainly slowing after many years of growth. And then under consumption, right? A lot of, there's not a lot of social safety net there. And so people save and they save to uh, make sure that they don't run out of money to pay for, uh, you know, housing and, and medical expenses, et cetera. So it's hard to get the average person to go out there and spend when the they don't have that social safety net. And so it's very tempting to think that, you know, okay, the market's moved a lot. This has to mean something. And, you know, I, I think at best it's, it's premature. At worst, it's a complete um, false narrative that this is uh, going to do much for the real economy. So it's really a wait and see at this point. But if you look at the structural problems in China, they mirror a lot with Japan. And you know how long it took to get them out of that quagmire. Uh, a lot longer than most people expect. Hi, Justin and Luke. Could you comment on Barrick Gold, ticker symbol G-O-L-D? I'm interested in buying more shares to hold, but I've been watching the stock price rise. Is it a good mining stock to buy or too expensive? Could you please give me your opinion? I'll be listening for answers. Thanks. All right, look at Barrick Gold, and it is one of the largest gold miners out there. $35 billion market cap, and we own this for clients. So, uh, simple answer is yes, we like it. The earnings for this year are supposed to be up 52% to $1.27 and then $1.74 next year. And those estimates continue to move higher. We had some good uh, earnings reports as of late. And you know, if you look at forward-looking earnings, you're talking about low teens multiple with strong growth, especially if gold continues to march higher, which we talked about the demand out of the east. And I think still a lot of uh, dry powder left for investors here uh, domestically to um, to chase gold higher. And I think uh, that, is, that is happening to a degree. And so uh, I, I think you could see gold at 3,000 an ounce in the next uh, 12, to, 12 to 18 months. And uh, obviously the, the miners would benefit from that. Now, uh, GOLD, uh, Barrick, is a, a bit different than a lot of the gold miners. Uh, a, because it's large, but also does have some copper exposure as well, which we which we also like. We also like copper. So uh, I like that uh, bit of a diversity there. And, uh, you know, I, I think it is a relatively undervalued uh, miner. And so this is, uh, if you're looking at uh, some of the gold miners, this is one of the better ones to buy out there. And obviously, we own it. So thanks for the call. Now, let's touch a little bit on CDs, CDs. And... Uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, the Fed has started to cut rates and to potentially lock in rates, lock in high yields, uh, a lot of investors have bought CDs, especially for buying them from Fidelity or Schwab, one of the big brokers out there. And what, but, but what a lot of people don't know is that usually the highest yielding CDs that are out there have what is called a call feature, which means that before they mature, the bank can give you your money back and stop paying you that yield. That's basically what it is. And a lot of people don't know that. They just look at that yield and they think, oh, 5%, 5.5%, whatever it is, that sounds nice and juicy, but they're not looking at the fine print. They're not uh, understanding that uh, they're purchasing callable CDs. So they don't really know what they're signing up for. And Many of them are surprised when it is called away from them. Okay. And so investors are going to have to reinvest that cash when they're called away now at lower rates. That's why these banks are calling them away is because those rates are lower and then go uh, borrow uh, money at, at, at cheaper rates. The average 12 month CD on bankrate.com right now is only 4.8%. And so after the Fed rate cut of 50 basis points, rates have come down. Now, most CDs aren't callable. So understand that. But ones that are the ones that are typically offer the highest rates and advertised yields on callable cities tend to be about 0.4% higher than the non callable ones with the same duration. And once again, these are typically sold through Fidelity, Schwab, and about 18% of CDs bought and sold through Fidelity this year were callable in some way, shape or form. And so uh, you know, the amount of money poured in $650 billion into brokered CDs since rates started to rise in 2022. 
And so there's just a, a lot of potential for uh, these rates to uh, these CDs to be called away. So uh, I, I, I highlight this because it's always important. I stress this time and time again, uh, which is know what you own. Don't just look at the headline. Don't just look at the name of a mutual fund or an ETF. I think that's exactly what you're getting. Look at the underlying holdings. Look at the features of the particular um, product that you're, that you're buying. Whether it's a CD, it could be a bond as well. Bonds can be called away uh, uh, on top of that. And so and this isn't just a CD thing. This could be a, a corporate bond uh, issue that you are looking for that juicy yield. That's why a lot of times you want to look at yield to worst as opposed to yield to maturity. That can help you understand what is the worst case scenario. If it does get called away, what is my worst yield I would I would be getting? And so that's why yield to worst tends to be a much better way to look at these um at these figures as opposed to uh, yield to maturity or APR or, or dividend rate, okay? Now, both Luke and I love your live calls. So let's talk with Sid in North Carolina looking at Humana. Hi, Justine. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your time. Of course. Uh, this one and United both are in my radar for quite some time. Mm-hmm. But I looked at Humana today, got down by 12%, um, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure this is a good entry point. Uh, if you if you have uh, some thoughts around this one, I'm more than happy to take your inputs, and thank you so much once again. Yeah, uh, well, Humana's down uh, big, uh, along with Cigna, and it looks like lawmakers are criticizing new ant- and anti-competitive moves. And, you know, it, this is, uh, you know, I, I've said this for a while with a lot of these uh, medical uh, insurers is that, you know, Obamacare was is bas- was basically written by them and uh, it allowed them to expand profits dramatically. But we know that that just was never a system that was sustainable in earnings this year. It's supposed to be down 38 uh, percent from a high of twenty six dollars and ten cents last year, all time high. And so what are you going to pay for something that has negative earnings momentum? So on $16 in earnings, it's at still $280 per share. Okay, so and it's still a high teens multiple, market multiple for negatively uh, f- inflecting earnings growth, uh, regulatory overhang, uh, and uh, terrible men- momentum, right? It's at a 52-week low now. Relative strength is at 10. And frankly, if I zoom out to a monthly chart, you know, really doesn't get good support until around the 230 mark. It's at 280 now. So, you know, we might be getting there, but I just don't see any reason to step in front of this. Why are you going to try to catch a falling knife? That's a proverbial falling knife here. And you don't know where those regulatory issues are going to, to land. And so, especially when we're in a more populist environment, right, where it's uh, less about, you know, profits for corporations and, and it's more about, how do you support the the average person? And both sides of the aisle have their 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 method uh, to their madness of, of how to do that. Uh, but I ultimately think that you will get some sort of single payer Medicare for all type of uh, uh, system that will uh, greatly reduce the market uh, share and uh, market potential for a lot of these uh, medical insurers. And so uh, they just have been names that we haven't touched for a, a while. And, you know, for a while we looked kind of dumb because uh, they kept going higher. But I said, if you go back to my calls in 2020, 2021, you know, I, I just didn't love uh, these type of names because of that regulatory uh, overhang that I knew would probably change at some point. And now it, now it certainly is inflecting that way. And so while, you know, now it's down from over five, nearly, let's see, $570 per share, roughly, I'll put it at two twenty. Uh, sorry, 280, and I think uh, it's headed lower. So I would pass on it. I think you have much better uh, risk versus rewards out there as opposed to trying to catch this falling knife. Thanks for the call. Now we have time for one more question from the Invest Talk Voice Bank that came in earlier on 8 at 8, 99 chart. Hi there. This is Ralph from Chicago. Uh, I was calling about 3M. I bought it around $100. It's kind of surged since then. I was wondering if this is a good time to take profits or hold on for the long term. Thank you. 
All right, looking at 3M, and they had some uh, lawsuit issues. They seem to be resolved uh, somewhat, and it certainly gained uh, pretty nice momentum. It's uh, low back in 2023. It was around $70. Now we're at 137 so it's uh, nearly doubled. And it, it is into some resistance, though, between here and call it 145 So you're in that resistance zone. Uh, earnings are supposed to be 788 next year. On $137 stock, you know, I think it's a it's a bit rich uh, after this move. Because what are you going to pay? You're going to pay a 20 multiple for modest uh, earnings growth? I just don't see it. I just don't see any reason to jump uh, on it at these levels. Um, so uh, I do see a lot of overhead resistance. Uh, I see a, uh, a valuation that just does not look that great after these, after this um uh, move so i would be trimming it and having a trailing stop and i would use see i would use the 50-day moving average for that trailing stop goes below that sell the rest thanks for the call well that about does it i'm justin klein it's another invest talk program we thank you for listening and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads which you can find anytime at itunes spotify google play and be sure to rate and review on itunes as well and please remember Our wealth webinar is coming up one week from today on ways to enhance your retirement savings and effective strategies for managing your 401k. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. The newest Invest Talk wealth webinar is happening online and free in just a few days. The Invest Talk Wealth Webinar will focus on effective strategies for managing your 401k and enhancing your retirement savings. Go to investtalk.com and sign up for our upcoming Wealth Webinar, October 8th. It's free to attend, but you must pre-register. And please tell your friends.